when I was in primary school, I remember attending the various sporting events, sporting carnivals, and, you know, just having a crack at the, the different sports events. Well, one of the ones that I was really pretty poor at was this, high jump. Right? In fact, uh, those days, they used to use what was called the scissor technique. don't know if you've ever heard of that before. The scissor technique is that you just jump over the uh, bar by lifting one leg up over the other. Right? Since then, they've uh, started to get a little more technical with jumping over the bar, and they go over back first. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Now, I can't imagine it being too good for your neck on the landing, but uh, they've got a couple of feet of padding there, so I suppose that compensates. All I remember was the sand pit, and it wasn't too nice and soft when you when you got down the other side anyway. But so in a sense, uh, the high jump is the kind of like opposite to the limbo rock. You know the limbo rock? You know? Uh, how low can you go? All right? Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Jack go under limbo stick. And of course the limbo rock was uh, played at dance nights or parties and you know you had two people holding up the bar and then people would be going around in a queue trying to get under that bar and as you get successful the bar gets lowered until people start dropping out falling on their backs but you see all sorts of contortions and sort of funny shapes people put themselves in just to try and get under this bar well let me have a see if this will work but here's an example <laughs> Yeah, they all started. Yep, you enjoy the music. Yep, yeah, I can see that. Uh, well, if a person successfully went under the bar, they'd be allowed to join the row again and, and hence it goes on. But the bar would start getting lower and lower as you got successful. A little unfair with that stick, isn't it? It's going up and down. And you're like, oh, which, which level do I get to here? Well, that's an idea, isn't it, for our church camp? You know, Saturday night activity, the limbo rock. I don't know. Someone might like to uh, organise some of that. The high, you'd rather the high jump? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to use the analogy of the high jump later as we consider what Peter is saying in today's passage. But if you recall some of last week's message there, Peter was there saying that the church is privileged beyond measure. He also stated earlier that he likened our faith to being more precious than refined gold. That's how valuable your faith is. He explained that we, the church, are the fulfillment of the ages, that even the prophets and angels never got to see nor experience what we see and experience as Christians. What follows this week is the response the church gives to all the great and mighty things that God has done for us. He says, in light of all this, therefore, therefore, what is and should be our response to what God has done? And this is what he's laying out in today's passage. And this passage, I'll admit, is somewhat of a high jump. There are a number of oughts in the passage, a number of commands that set the bar for the jump at a certain height. And as I was studying this passage, the prophets of old came back to me and the issues that they had with the people of God. And as you know, the people of God tended to favour the false prophets. Now, why? Why did they tend to favour the false prophets? Because the prophets would tell them what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear peace, peace in their lives when God was unhappy with their behaviour. And uh, the false prophets were saying he was happy with them when he really wasn't. They preferred that the bar be taken down to their level rather than raise themselves up to meet God at the level that he had set. And the false prophets and people persecuted those who told them what God had affirmed. 
because the true prophets of God, if they were guilty of anything, it was keeping the bar at the height that God had demanded it to be set. So we begin looking at this uh, text today. Peter writes, he says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, <laughs> if you really want to know literally what he's saying there, it's, it is gird up the loins of your mind for action. Unusual statement, isn't it? You have the sense there where a person, like in that day, if they needed to run somewhere, they had to uh, tuck their long clothing up into their undergarment uh, to be able to run. It was to free up the legs to be able to run fast. So we have an example here in the days of Elijah. Hand of the Lord was on Elijah. He girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. You see, your mind, your mind is so critical to your Christian life. We live in an age which is dominated by the rule of emotion and sentiment, and that rules us. And instead of thinking and making up one's mind, firming up the truth, the tendency is to want to go with what the waves of whatever sentiment is out there in society. And they think you are wrong for not accepting their ways. I'm sure you felt it. You know, my truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. Can't tell me what to do. And what matters is, you know, the GEI, agenda, equity, and inclusion. I mean, you must accept diversity. And of course, you know, if you don't accept diversity, we won't accept you. Diversity comes to you, but not with your Christian values. That's not it. So because you do not accept that everyone is entitled to their own truth. Wow. How dare you? How dare you do that? That you accept only that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And heaven forbid that he's the only way to the creator of heaven and earth. You see, that's why they get all upset because they can't accept that truth. They want you to go along with what they say. You see, our faith is grounded in this truth. That's why we don't move an inch on it. Jesus is the only way to God. We don't move an inch. And so Peter is saying mental alertness is critical. As Paul Ackmeyer says, quote, it refers to tough thinking. People ready to live lives to those, a counter to those of their contemporaries, unquote. So you need to be aware of the spirit of the false prophet. They want to lower the bar. They want to try and make it easier. They want popularity and acceptance. They want notoriety and they want fame. They'll say something that will bring the bar down and make it easier, hence make it themselves popular. But Peter says this, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Now, I'm not telling you that. This comes from the Holy Spirit. True? The false prophet would have God fit our ways rather than the reverse. So we need to be aware of that temptation. Sentiment and emotions, as good as they may be, will try and sway you no end, but you must really master those unruly senses with the alertness of the mind, critical thinking, convictions, actually stem from the mind. Paul says something very similar in Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You know, <clears throat> as a pastor... I will be judged by God more strictly than you will be because I teach his word to a number of people. So I'm more culpable, more responsible. And so I have much more to fear than you have. I'm representing what God says. And if I misrepresent what he says in his word, then I'm in big trouble. 
So I had to make a decision long ago, and I hope you reflect on this too. Who will you fear more, man or God? The false prophets, they wanted to lower the bar so it's easier for people to jump over, including themselves. No wonder they're popular. And sure, people can listen all they like to the false prophets with their smooth and alluring and popular speech. That lower bar height appeals to those who are longing to hear what the itching ears want to hear. But where's it going to leave them? And for me, if I said nothing, if I'm just willing to see people head for that cliff and say nothing, oh, sure, it's going to be a lot easier, a lot easier. I don't have to put up with any hassle, you know, but then the people would suffer loss with God. And who knows to what extent, because I'm not their judge. But in preaching God's word for all that it says, it costs, it does. And over the years, yeah, I've struggled to give the full account uh, or the full counsel of God to the church because I know that some of the things that I have to say are tough and unpopular. But you know what? Once we get through this life, the only thing that counts is how we have been faithful to the truth, to the Lord. And, you know, the troubles that we face in life, they're really going to count for zip if we hear one day God say, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that's what drives me, and I sure hope that is what drives you. He says, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace that is brought to you, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The clarity of mind, self-control is the name of the game. We know what people are like when they are not sober. They do some pretty silly things, don't they? The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, that young pastor, he says, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Be self-controlled and alert. And our hope set completely on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what we have with that statement is incentive. Incentive. If you really want an incentive as to get over that bar that God sets, it's because there's something waiting for you at the end. The grace that has brought you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What that means is salvation. The salvation of God that will come to you when Jesus comes. So this is what motivates us. This is why we get up each morning and not only thankful that we are alive, but thankful for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Paul in Timothy also says that we're to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. So if we're going to do that, if we discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, if we're going to strive to be holy as God is holy, then we will need to plant our hope on the glorious and gracious salvation that's going to be revealed to us. That needs to be firmly in our hearts so that we can move forward with God in the present. So as obedient children, he says, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. As I said before, it'd be lovely to lower the bar, wouldn't it? The lower the bar of holiness. And you know, for some people, Lowering that bar means compassion. You heard that before? It means the compassionate approach. But you know what? It leads to unholy lives. We want to be, we want to act in grace. Absolutely. We want to be gracious. This is how we ought to be as a church community. Now, when a Christian knocks the bar off at the height God sets, when they attempt to jump to, over that bar of holiness, you know, it's one thing to encourage the person to say, you know, oh, try again. You did well. Get up. Keep trying. But I'll tell you what, it's another thing altogether to say, oh, the bar is too high. Let's lower it. 
see, this is the problem, not only in the present day church, but all throughout church history. Many Christians, I believe, are going to be called to account for this. We can't lower God's standards. We can't change the bar height to which God calls us. Holiness is holiness, is it not? And isn't this the problem we see throughout Scripture? And again, as I said last week, this is not about sinless perfection. People focus on that. I think they are missing the point. Look at the way Paul approaches this. When he talks about the life of Christ, when he talks about the future, he says this, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, right, this is his approach. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Metaphorically, get it? And their glory, their glory in their shame. Their mind set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see where Paul's emphasis lies? Not in a so-called sinless perfection, but on the continual pursuit of a life of God in Christ. That's his point. Be like God. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. So what is holiness? It's a life given over to God. Crucified with Christ, Paul says. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. A life that has as its first priority to be pleasing to God. That's what holiness is on about. And this is what we strive towards realizing the life of Christ living in us. That's a big high bar, isn't it? In this next section, Peter says to conduct yourselves in fear during your time of stay on earth. Now, does that sound strange to you? Conduct yourself in fear? Why would he say live in fear? Well, first, he's rather specific. He says, conduct yourselves in fear or demonstrate in how you live your understanding of the holiness of God. That would invoke some fear, wouldn't it? Now, fear may sound negative, just as pain. Pain is understood negatively, right? Do you understand pain as a negative thing? I'm sure you do. However, it can be positive, you know. Pain is an indicator that something's wrong and needs to be fixed, is it not? You have an infection in your gum, say, right? It really hurts, really hurts. What if you never felt that pain? What if it was not there? Well, that infection would continue and you'd do nothing about it and it could turn out very badly for you, right? Same is true of any infection or whatever. It doesn't alert you with pain. What if you put your hand on a sizzling hot plate on a stove and you never felt pain, which would be pretty spectacular, wouldn't it? Not to mention if pain was actually pleasurable. Think about that. You wouldn't have a hand left. You see, pain has to be painful. It has to be an awful experience for you to be alerted to the seriousness of the problem. And, you know, fear operates in this same way. Fear is like pain. It alerts you to the fact that God is not a God who shows partiality, as Peter says here. Right? And we all may think that we're one of God's favourites. Right? We always tend to think that, oh, I'm one of God's favourites, right? And it's nice to think that. But the reality check is, the truth is, he does not show favouritism when it comes to making judgments. So fear. 
positively helps us from taking lightly the need for holy living. People don't like pastors being so black and white, do they? Eh? Not inclusive enough. That's what our culture tells us. But Christians in their care for people can be subtly influenced from the pagan culture around about them that espouses its values that we know are contrary to God's. But even in spiritual judgment, which we're required to make, we're required to make judgments of all things, we can be subtly drawn into making the same judgments that they make out there because it's so pervasive, right? I uh, put up on our Telegram channel this week, the Growth Group channel, and uh, it it's a little challenging video on how Christians are to obey God in the realm of selecting a life partner. So we've got another number of young people here, so this will be prick up your ears with this one, that even dating a non-Christian, the Christian is disobeying God. Now, that sounds harsh, right? That sounds harsh. But if you really want God's opinion, there's no denying it since the Bible is pretty specific in the realm of relationships. Now, in that short video, it is found that there is a fellow thinking that he's going to be able to convert this non-Christian girlfriend of his to Christ. That's what he's thinking. Now, if we're splitting hairs, right, splitting hairs, you could say that he is, has not yet yoked himself to her, right, since they're not yet married, right? Fair enough, fair enough. But then are they sleeping together? Where is that relationship headed, right? If not there, in marriage too, where is it going? Now, I've known couples who have started both as non-Christians, got married, and both later have become Christians while they were married. I've known uh, of a Christian who dated a non-Christian who then became a Christian after they married, right? Praise God that it worked out, but it worked out actually in spite of the fellow's actions, not because of it not because of them the bottom line he actually acted against wisdom and though he disobeyed god by marrying the non-christian it actually worked out for him he was fortunate right he was fortunate but he acted wrongly but it doesn't always go fortunately like it did for this fellow in fact i know of a person who at least i thought at the time was a strong christian he started out going going out with this uh, very nice looking young lady. Uh, she really loved him, was happy to be involved with the church youth at the time. But he knew he couldn't marry her because she hadn't turned to Christ. Right? And he was in a dilemma because she really hadn't accepted Christ. And realizing it, he broke it off for a month. Right? For a month. Until he missed her too much, he ended up getting back together with her, eventually marrying her, knowing that she was not a Christian. And eventually, he stopped coming to turn his back on Christ. Tragic, isn't it? But it started with disobedience to God. It started with foolishness, not wisdom. Because where is a relationship with a non-Christian going? Right? Now, the bar is high. I know. I know. But the man and woman of faith will accept it, right? They've come to realize the depth of our lostness. Because just look at what had to be done in order for us to be forgiven. I mean, if holiness was not such a big issue, reflect on what had to be done for us to be redeemed. The cost was so significant. So please don't make light of the holiness to which we are called. The motive for this is that we're no longer our own. Now, this is a real challenge as well. Crucified with Christ. So where are we in that? Crucified with Christ. I mean, have you surrendered over your life to Christ? 
Are you taking up your cross daily? And the cross is not a lovely ornament you wear around your neck, right? It's an instrument of death. When you reflect on that, wow, Jesus says, take up your death cross daily and follow him. Paul says, you've been bought at a price. It means you're a slave. You're not, you don't own yourself. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, so that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, of course, no one's forcing you to live a holy life. No one's forcing you. But I'm talking to people who I'm assuming has, have willingly surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. I'm talking to, for the most part, are people who have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And you see, this is Peter's point here. The cost of your salvation was not in terms of a monetary value, but in terms of a life given. The precious son of God, whose worth far exceeds monetary values, you can't put a price on his life. You notice what Peter calls his blood here? Spotless. Spotless. Therefore, the cost of your redemption just went up a hundredfold. He had no sin of his own. He had no reason to offer himself as a payment for you and for me, other than the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In other words, God paid a hefty price for your redemption, for my redemption. So dare we be ungrateful and just live however we please? It's not the right spirit, is it? So it was judgment and eternal damnation that was hanging over our head. But through the precious blood of Jesus, that huge price was paid and we have been redeemed. Now, in this last section, it really answers the question, did we get lucky? Right? Did Christ die and we just happened to capitalise on it? Was this all just an accident? Was it fate? Well, of course, the Greeks, including uh, many nations in the East, uh, see things as happening either by the will of the heavens, by the will of the gods, or a thing called fate. Fate, just destined to happen by some non-existing thing. However, this here is thoroughly based in Jewish thought that the divine plan of salvation that underlined all the events of the world that were happening were, in fact, preordained by God, right? Before the foundation of the world. And, of course, Jesus was there <clears throat> before the foundation of the world, but has now been made manifest in these last days. Hard to comprehend, isn't it? However, what Peter is saying here is it makes abundantly clear that Jesus was no accident, nor was it just fate. It didn't just happen. It's linked to God's eternal plan of salvation. He was predestined or foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times. The last times have begun. Have I told you that before? The last times have already begun. We live in the last days metaphorically days it can be a, you know number of existing moments of time but the last days here is the central point at the turn of the events in the world the major crux or crucial time that the last days began i think you might know what it is death and resurrection of jesus because a resurrection took place he was raised from the dead that's a significant thing within the creation, right? Because it's not normal. It's supernatural. He was raised to a new level of existence, which, of course, we are also going to share within what's called the resurrection of the body. 
Paul speaks to this predestination here as well when he talks about God's wisdom in a mystery that's now disclosed. That mystery is Christ who has come, brought the church together. This hidden wisdom, he says, which God, here it is, predestined before the ages to our glory. Wow. Peter started this epistle with acknowledging that the believers there in northern Turkey are chosen by the foreknowledge, the predestination of God the Father, and by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Through Jesus, we have been restored to God, which is why our faith and hope are in God. Peter's been instructing the church about living life for God, that God has redeemed us to be like him, holy. And Peter is saying that we must keep the high jump bar at the level at which God sets it. That when we fall, we knock the bar off, we get up and we try again. We keep going. But you know what? We have an advantage. We're not normal people. We're not just people in the flesh. We have a big advantage. Earlier on, Peter has said, we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So God is overseeing our journey, ready to be revealed in the last time. We're protected by his power. He oversees us, so that's a big advantage. And then again, at the beginning of his second epistle, he says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, if we focus on the I can't, uh, I can't, please ask yourself the question, I can't or I don't want to? Because there are two things there. If God has given us all, all we need for life and godliness, if he has given us of his spirit, then the answer is we can. Wow. But we must firstly be honest with what the scripture says. And it says we can, right? Secondly, we must understand that we're not talking about sinless perfection. That was an old modernist way of thinking. Paul talks about striving towards the goal, the upward call of God in Christ. No doubt many people have confused God's call to be to holiness as, you know, a demand for sinless perfection and have rejected it out of hand. I'm sorry. You know what? They suffer from legalism. They're the legalists. They like to dot the I, cross the T's. But relationships are different from this. Doesn't John in his epistle say that anyone who says he has no sin is a liar? It doesn't sound like anybody can be sinless. Because John says they'd be a liar if they claim that. But doesn't he also say in his epistle that one born of God cannot continue to live life of unrepentant sin? Like, is he at odds with himself? Not at all. He understands the Christian life from a relational standpoint. And by the same token, who can say it's a good thing that we at times act in an unholy way? That ain't a good thing. You see, the problem is people are too legalistic and we all need to examine ourselves and ask whether we are just resisting holiness because we like our sin too much. Heavy price to pay. Besides, we as Christians die to sin, right? And this is really what baptism meant in your baptism. You know, the Christian follows Christ through his death and his resurrection. When we're baptized, we say good riddance to the unholiness of the world. Death to that. And hello to life in the spirit. Will we always be successful? Not at all. Not at all. But we continue to encourage one another to aim at getting over the bar. Be holy as I am holy. And of course, realize the difference that this approach 
is very different from the person who says, let's lower the bar. As I said before, that's the emphasis of the false prophet. They have always, always, always led God's people into judgment. Think about that for a moment. See, nowadays the church has this convoluted idea that grace means we can lower the bar, lower the standard. But in fact, grace means that we can uphold the standard. After all, right, if God sent his son to die for our sins, then I can confidently assert that he doesn't intend for us to continually live in them. What an enormous price he had to pay that our sins be remitted. I'm sure he doesn't want us to keep, you know, laying around in the, the, the mud like that sow who was washed and then goes back into the mud heap. Of course, the choice will always be yours. And you need to decide, be holy. As I am holy is uh, perhaps just wishful thinking on the apostle's part or that he's deadly serious, saying that we need to be accepting the bar at the height to which God had set. Amen. So I, I hope and pray that God will minister his word to your heart today as we uh, consider what the apostle is saying.